Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is my first time at PALS and uh, I spent this afternoon just sort of walking around in, in utter and total amazement. And uh, really, uh, my conclusion after, after seeing this place is it's really just an honor to be here. And, um, and I think it's so inspiring for independent booksellers everywhere and a realization that this, this can work. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about my experience with Crescent Security Group, but I also wanted to spend more time than I usually do talking about Blackwater, given the events of the, the last few days. Um, but I wanted to just sort of start by telling you how I, I got into this, this world. I, I first started going to Iraq in the fall of 2004 as a reporter for the, for the Washington Post. My, my initial assignment was basically to cover the US military experience in Iraq and sort of what the ground war looked like and, and who was fighting it. So I spent the fall of 2004 doing that and then all of 2005. And when I got to the end of, of 2005, uh, I found that, that I really wasn't done with Iraq for reasons that I had difficulty explaining to my family and trying to define. But also, my newspaper, of course, felt that it was an incredibly important story. And there was this sense, I think, at the time that, that a sort of fatigue was setting in, you know, at the end of, of 2005, that people were already sort of becoming tired of, of the, the drumbeat of stories about violence and mayhem. And so we tried to look at different ways to, to cover the war. And one of my editors approached me and said, well, why don't we look into the, the private side of the war? That, that issue encompasses some 190,000 people who work as contractors in Iraq. 190,000. That's some 30,000 more than the maximum number of US troops that have fought in Iraq at, at any given time. I immediately became focused on a subset of those people, which were the sort of hired guns that, that were operating in, in, in support of the, the US-led coalition. You know, when I was covering the military, I, I would see them everywhere. You know, you'd see them in the chow halls um, on, the, on the US military bases, or you would, you would see them on the roads. You know, they, lo they looked like they had they'd sort of driven out of a, a, like a Mad Max movie. You know, they, 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 wore, they were obviously civilians. They wore civilian clothes, but they were, they were heavily armed. And they drove around in these, these crazy multicolored vehicles, many of which were significantly armored, were modified pickup trucks, or, um, you know, sort of all manner of, uh, of vehicles. And, you know, I never really understood, you know, kind of what they did or who they were or how many of them there were, or how much combat they were seeing, if any. And um, so the, the initial goal was just to sort of find out what, what this, this world was all about. Um, so I, I made a contact who hooked me up with this company called, called Crescent Security Group. You know, like, like everyone at the time, I, you know, I, I knew basically a few companies, Blackwater, of course, the the main one, and a, and a few others, you know, a few other large companies, DynCorp and, and Triple Canopy. And, um, and, you know, so this guy hooked me up with this company called Crescent, which I, I really knew very little about. They were based in Kuwait City. So I made a contact with a guy who identified himself as the, the director of security for the company. And I, I flew to Kuwait City from California, where I, where I live. And uh, I got off the plane. and. And you know they were living. This this company was living out of a house in in the Kuwait City suburbs. I, I say in the book it was, it was it was the strangest sensation. It was like it was like basing a paramilitary group like in the middle of the Portland suburbs or you know or the San Fernando Valley or something like that. And they kept their vehicles out back. And the next morning I got up with the same guy who picked me up at the airport, and he uh, we we piled into this truck and we started making our way up to the border, we were totally alone. Like, none of the other guys were, were with us. They all went up to the border on their own. It was about an hour's drive from, the Kuwait, from Kuwait City up to the Iraq border. And, uh, you know, I quickly realized that these guys, like, 
commuted to the war. You know, they got in their trucks every morning and they, they drove up to, to Iraq to, to do their jobs. So we're, we're moving toward the border and we, we, we get up there and there's a big, huge US military base right on the Kuwait-Iraq border called Camp Navistar. And we, now the sun is up and we pull into this, this big uh, sort of vacant lot, like a big um, sort of a, a lot about the size of, of two football fields. And um, many of the other contractors are, are, um, are, are milling around. And um, so, and, there's, and there's, there's all these semi-trucks that they're going to be escorting into Iraq. They're sort of idling in a line and, you know, next to them. And then they're just standing there and they're chatting and smoking and they're wearing uh, khaki pants and, and, uh, and sort of polo shirts. And, you know, I get out of the truck and I start looking around and immediately I, I start to feel like something's kind of amiss. Because I take a look at the trucks, and you know, this was a time when it's hard to—it's hard, really hard to overstate the violence that was going on in Iraq at this at this time. It was an extremely dangerous place, and nobody that I knew, including the Washington Post, was traveling around Iraq in anything but you know heavily armored vehicles. We, we the Post, we had these armored Jeep Cherokees that we drove around in, and everybody drove in armored vehicles. But these guys were getting ready to drive into Iraq in pickup trucks. Like the kind of pickup trucks you, you would see, like driving around around Portland, and I thought that was kind of weird. And and um, and then I, I, you know, I noticed that, that nobody had any guns, and I was thinking, well, you know, that's kind of weird. And so I, I asked one of the guys, so, you know, wh where are the guns? And uh, he said, oh yeah, you know, well we we can't bring our weapons into Kuwait, so we keep them in a shipping container on the other side of the border. And we pick them up when we get across the border. And I said, well, you know, is, is that safe? And he said, well, you know, it's funny you should mention that because just a couple months ago, we, we got across the border, we cracked open the shipping container, and all the weapons were gone. And uh, I said, well, well, what happened? You know, because obviously you can't, you can't work in Iraq, you know, as a private security company, you know, pretty much fundamentally, with, unless you're armed. And uh, he said, oh, well, the owner of the company sent out $50,000 on the black market with one of the Iraqi employees into Iraq, and they bought a whole bunch of uh, new weapons. So the guy apparently came back with um, you know, dozens of AK-47s and ammunition and, and law rockets and all kinds of other stuff. And when they got the weapons back, they, they checked them, and the serial numbers were identical to the ones that, that had been ripped off. They, they literally like, bought back their their own weapons. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, sort of standing here, uh, you know, with kind of a, you know, sort of a feeling, of, you know, that, that something is really, really not right. And then I start to, to talk to some of the, the, the guys who work for the company. And um, one of the first guys I met was this incredibly friendly guy, this really big, bulky guy who, um, um, who started to tell me that he, he had worked as a, uh, a police officer in suburban Minneapolis um, for several years. And, um, and then he had applied for his job in Iraq over the internet and had gotten a job working as a, a private security contractor, which you know, seemed weird enough to me. And he was wearing, he was wearing, this, like, he was wearing a baseball cap with, like, that said EMT on the, the, on the front, like, big block letters. And he explained to me that he was the company medic 